Okay, so the journey home has begun and uh, just like the past three years, every time I leave it rains. I think Naomi is always sad to see me go. I'm certainly sad uh, to leave. So there's my bike packed up, a little bit wet now, but uh, all ready to hop on the plane. Can't wait uh, to see the family. So, Nijmegen Central Station and then uh, Schiphol Airport, Dubai, Cape Town, Hope. So, I'm so Okay, so uh, I'm at Schiphol Airport. I'll be boarding my flight in about uh, an hour and a bit. And uh, it's great to be here. I'm always sad to leave the Netherlands. It's been a wonderful trip, but uh, I must say I'm looking forward to getting home. So uh, next stop, Dubai and then Cape Town. Now, one of the things that I did today was uh, before uh, leaving Nijmegen, and I went for a little ride on my Brompton bicycle. And uh, while I was riding, I came across a beautiful statue to honor a, a scientist at Radboud University called Marjolein Krik. And uh, it seems that she was being honored by her colleagues in the scientific community because she was the first woman scientist to have uh, spliced and decoded the genome. I hope that's the right terminology. And in particular, they were honoring her because uh, she's a woman who has uh, achieved great success in this uh, particular field which is often regarded as, as uh, a male dominated field and it struck me that um, we have a similar challenge in ethics and in uh, theology that uh, very often we uh, suppress uh, particularly those who are dominant powerfully or socially uh, suppress those who are not at the center of social identity and it reminded me of uh, the book of Samuel Wells an introduction uh, to Christian ethics in which he writes about the fact that there's this sort of universal ethic that uh, people tend to uh, relate to what Kant may have called the categorical imperative a sort of uh, the common good what is good for uh, for everybody and um, that kind of ethic a sort of universal ethic seldom suits everyone in society in fact it tends to fit towards the sort of fat middle of the bell curve and you find that there are interest groups, specific interest groups that get excluded from that. And so it's been interesting to see over the last number of decades, you can read about this in David Ford's book, uh, The Modern Theologians, I'll put links to these in the show notes, the emergence of what uh, Samuel Wells calls subversive theologies or subversive ethics, uh, feminist and womanist theologies, black theologies, Asian theologies, liberation theologies, uh, all of these attempts to remind those who do theology in the center and ethics in the center that those kind of universal systems don't always appeal to everybody. So sometimes I think uh, people who occupy the center feel a little bit unsettled when they see uh, someone who's engaged in a subversive activity, a subversive theology or a subversive ethics. But uh, the statue of Marilyn Crick reminded me that very often we need someone who thinks differently, who approaches a problem from a different angle, to come in and destabilize or disturb uh, the given order in order to allow something new to happen. So remember, it's not a lecture, it's just a thought, but uh, my invitation to you is to think a little bit about some of those groupings that you relate to uh, in your community or in your line of work, in your theology or in your ministry. And uh, some of them may be engaged in a subversive task. How can you facilitate some space to listen carefully and uh, to see if there might not be something that you can learn there? So thanks for watching the video. Uh, I need to uh, get onto my flight. I see people are uh, coming through the gate. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, please subscribe. Uh, click the like button. It helps to make it a little more visible. Share the video. And uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Digital Dion or on my website, uh, dionfoster.com. So thanks for watching.
I'm so 